Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schatz. No. Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown, I, Mr. Jones. Mr. Sass, Mr. Sass, I, Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones, I, Ms. Duckworth, Ms. Duckworth, I. Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Van Hollen, I. Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sanders, no. Mr. Crapo, Mr. Crapo, I, Mr. McConnell, Mr. McConnell, I, Mr. Cornyn, Mr. Cornyn, I, Mr. Cruz, Mr. Cruz, I, Mr. Cotton, I'm sorry, Mr. Hawley, Mr. Hawley, I. Mr. Markey, Mr. Markey, no.
Mr. Lee, Mr. Lee, aye. Mr. Booker, Mr. Booker, no. The yeas are 89, the nays are 10, the bill is passed.
This is an NBC News special report. The trial of Donald J. Trump. Here is Lester Holt. Hello, everyone. It's just after noon in the East. We're coming on the air for live coverage of the United States Senate formally receiving articles of impeachment against President Donald J. Trump. The impeachment managers from the House now making the same walk they made yesterday with the articles of impeachment. The difference is uh, today they will actually formally present them. They will actually read the two articles of impeachment before the U.S. Senate. Again, a, a moment of... Uh, of, of calm and, and, and dignity on a very serious matter. Uh, let's go to uh, Casey Hunt right now on Capitol Hill, who will lay out the day for us and where this goes. Lester, this is a day of uh, very solemn formality. This is all uh, very carefully written down. As we have pointed out, this is only the third time in history that something like this has happened. The second time we've been able to watch it uh, on TV. And there you can see the Senate Sergeant of Arms is leading uh, this procession of those House managers. And what they're going to do here uh, is formally read them uh, to the Senate. The Senate will be accepting uh, the articles here. And that's going to kick off the process that we're going to see play out the rest of the day. A rare uh, soon uh, arrival of the Chief Justice of the United States, John Roberts. That's coming up at 2 o'clock this afternoon uh, after uh, this process has already uh, unfolded. And at that point, the senators are going to be sworn in uh, under a special oath that is reserved for uh, these types of, of occasions. They obviously all take an oath uh, when they take their offices. Initially, uh, this one, of course, uh, to render impartial justice. And that, of course, has been uh, the, the question hanging over this Capitol building uh, for the last weeks and months as this impeachment trial has uh, unfolded. Members uh, on both sides criticizing the other, uh, raising questions about the ability to be fair. So uh, today we're going to start to get some answers uh, to some of the questions about how this trial may play out. A lot of those decisions uh, made by the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, uh, who is under a lot of uh, pressure at this point. This, of course, is going to continue, though, into next week as arguments begin in earnest. And, Lester, you can see they're waiting at the door uh, of the United States Senate. We're going to lose uh, sight of them here for a moment as they walk out onto the floor. And there's the majority leader. And, at and 12 so noon, the Senate will receive the managers of the House of Representatives to exhibit the articles of impeachment against Donald John Trump, President of the United States. The hour of 12 noon having arrived and a quorum being present, the Sergeant at Arms will present the managers on the part of the House of Representatives. Mr. President and members of the Senate, I announce the presence of the managers on the part of the House of Representatives to conduct proceedings on behalf of the House concerning the impeachment of Donald John Trump, President of the United States. Managers on the part of the House will be received and escorted to the well of the Senate. The, the Sergeant at Arms will make the proclamation. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All persons are commanded to keep silent on pain of imprisonment. While the House of Representatives is exhibiting to the Senate of the United States articles of impeachment against Donald John Trump, President of the United States. The managers on the part of the House will now proceed. Mr. President, the managers on the part of the House of Representatives are present and ready to present the articles of impeachment, which have been preferred by the House of Representatives against Donald John Trump, President of the United States. The House adopted the following resolution, which with the permission of the Senate, I will read. House Resolution 798, appointing and authorizing managers for the impeachment trial of Donald John Trump, President of the United States. Resolve that Mr. Schiff, Mr. Nadler, Ms. Lofgren, Mr. Jeffries, Ms. Demings, Mr. Crow, and Ms. Garcia 
of Texas are appointed managers to conduct the impeachment trial against Donald John Trump, President of the United States, that a message be sent to the Senate to inform the Senate of these appointments, and that the managers so appointed may, in connection with the preparation and conduct of the trial, exhibit articles of impeachment to the Senate and take all other actions necessary, which may include the following. Employing legal, clerical, and other necessary assistance and incurring such other expenses as may be necessary to be paid from amounts available to the Committee on the Judiciary under applicable expense resolutions or from the applicable account of the House of Representatives. Number two, sending for persons and papers and filing with the Secretary of the Senate on the part of the House of Representatives any pleadings in conjunction with or subsequent to the exhibition of the articles of impeachment that the managers may consider necessary. With the permission of the Senate, I will now read the articles of impeachment, House Resolution 755. House Resolution 755, impeaching Donald John Trump, President of the United States, for high crimes and misdemeanors. Resolved that President that Donald J. Trump, President of the United States, is impeached for high crimes and misdemeanors, and that the following articles of impeachment be exhibited to the United States Senate. Articles of impeachment exhibited by the House of Representatives of the United States of America in the name of itself and of the people of the United States of America against Donald John Trump, President of the United States of America, in maintenance and support of its impeachment against him for high crimes and misdemeanors. Article 1, Abuse of Power. The Constitution provides that the House of Representatives shall have the sole power of impeachment and that the President shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. In his conduct of the office of the President of the United States, and in violation of his constitutional oath faithfully to execute the office of President of the United States, and to the best of his ability preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, and in violation of his constitutional duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed, Donald J. Trump has abused the powers of the presidency in that, using the powers of his high office, President Trump solicited the interference of a foreign government, Ukraine, in the 2020 United States presidential election. He did so through a scheme or course of conduct that included soliciting the government of Ukraine to publicly announce investigations that would benefit his reelection, harm the election prospects of a political opponent, and influence the 2020 United States presidential election to his advantage. President Trump also sought to pressure the government of Ukraine to take these steps by conditioning official United States government acts of significant value to Ukraine on its public announcement of the investigations. President Trump engaged in this scheme or course of conduct for corrupt purposes in pursuit of personal political benefit. In so doing, President Trump used the powers of the presidency in a manner that compromised the national security of the United States and undermined the integrity of the United States democratic process. He thus ignored and injured the interests of the nation. President Trump engaged in this scheme or course of conduct through the following means. Number one, President Trump acting both directly and through his agents within and outside the United States government corruptly solicited the government of Ukraine to publicly announce investigations into A, a political opponent, former Vice President Joseph R. Biden Jr., and B, a discredited theory promoted by Russia alleging that Ukraine rather than Russia interfered in the 2016 United States presidential election. Number two, with the same corrupt motives, President Trump acting both directly and through his agents within and outside the United States government, conditioned two official acts on the public announcement 
that he had requested. A, the release of $390 million, $91 million of United States taxpayer funds that Congress had appropriated on a bipartisan basis for the purpose of providing vital military and security assistance to Ukraine to oppose Russian aggression and which President Trump had ordered suspended. And B, a head of state meeting at the White House, which the President of Ukraine sought to demonstrate continued United States support for the government of Ukraine in the face of Russian aggression. Number three, faced with the public revelation of his actions, President Trump ultimately released the military and security assistance to the government of Ukraine but has persisted in openly and corruptly urging and soliciting Ukraine to undertake investigations for his personal political benefit. These actions were consistent with President Trump's previous invitations of foreign interference in United States elections. In all of this, President Trump abused the powers of the presidency by ignoring and injuring national security and other vital national interests to obtain an improper personal political benefit. He has also betrayed the nation by abusing his high office to enlist a foreign power in corrupting democratic elections. Wherefore, President Trump, by such conduct, has demonstrated that he will remain a threat to national security and the Constitution if allowed to remain in office, and has acted in a manner grossly incompatible with self-governance and the rule of law. President Trump thus warrants impeachment and trial, removal from office, and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States. Article 2, Obstruction of Congress. The Constitution provides that the House of Representatives shall have the sole power of impeachment and that the president shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. In his conduct of the office of president of the United States and in violation of his constitutional oath faithfully to execute the office of president of the United States and to the best of his ability preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States and in violation of his constitutional duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed, Donald J. Trump has directed the unprecedented, categorical, and indiscriminate defiance of subpoenas issued by the House of Representatives pursuant to its sole power of impeachment. President Trump has abused the power of the presidency in a manner offensive to and subversive of the Constitution in that the House of Representatives has engaged in an impeachment inquiry focused on President Trump's corrupt solicitation of the government of Ukraine to interfere in the 2020 United States presidential election. As part of this impeachment inquiry, the committees undertaking the investigation served subpoenas seeking documents and testimony deemed vital to the inquiry from various executive branch agencies and offices and current and former officials. In response, without lawful cause or excuse, President Trump directed executive branch agencies, offices, and officials not to comply with those subpoenas. President Trump thus interposed the powers of the presidency against the lawful subpoenas of the House of Representatives and assumed to himself functions and judgments necessary to exercise the sole power of impeachment vested by the Constitution in the House of Representatives. President Trump abused the powers of his high office through the following means. Number one, directing the White House to defy a lawful subpoena by withholding the production of documents sought therein by the committees. Number two, directing other executive branch agencies and offices to defy lawful subpoenas and withhold the production of documents and records from the, com from the committees in response to which the Department of State, the Office of Management and Budget, Department of Energy, and Department of Defense refused to produce a single document or record. Directing current and former, number three, directing current and former executive branch officials 
not to cooperate with the committees, in response to which nine administration officials defied subpoenas for testimony, namely John Michael Mick Mulvaney, Robert B. Blair, John A. Eisenberg, Michael Ellis, Preston Wells Griffith, Russell T. Vaught, Michael Duffy, Brian McCormick, and T. Ulrich Breckbull. These actions were consistent with President Trump's previous efforts to undermine United States government investigations into foreign interference in United States elections. Through these actions, President Trump sought to arrogate to himself the right to determine the propriety, scope, and nature of the impeachment inquiry into his own conduct, as well as the unilateral prerogative to deny any and all information to the House of Representatives in the exercise of its sole power of impeachment. In the history of the Republic, no president has ever ordered the complete defiance of an impeachment inquiry or sought to obstruct and impede so comprehensively the ability of the House of Representatives to investigate high crimes and misdemeanors. This abuse of office served to cover up the President's own repeated misconduct and to seize and control the power of impeachment and thus to nullify a vital constitutional safeguard vested solely in the House of Representatives. In all of this, President Trump acted in a manner contrary to his trust as president and subversive of constitutional government to the great prejudice of the cause of law and justice and to the manifest injury of the people of the United States. Wherefore, President Trump, by such conduct, has demonstrated that he will remain a threat to the Constitution if allowed to remain in office and has acted in a manner grossly incompatible with self-governance and the rule of law. President Trump thus warrants impeachment and trial, removal from office, and disqualification to hold and enjoy any office of honor, trust, or profit under the United States. Mr. President, that completes the exhibition of the articles of impeachment against Donald John Trump, President of the United States. The managers request that the Senate take order for the trial. The managers now request leave to withdraw. Thank you, Mr. Schiff. The Senate will duly notify the House of Representatives when it is ready to proceed to trial. Mr. President. Majority Leader. With the information of Senators pursuant, pursuant to yesterday's order, at 2 o'clock today, the Senate will proceed to the consideration of the articles of impeachment. The Chief Justice of the United States will preside over the trial as required in Article 1, Section 3, Clause 6 of the United States Constitution. Also, under the previous order, the presiding officer has been authorized to appoint a committee of four senators, two upon the recommendation of the majority leader and two upon the recommendation of the Democratic leader to escort the Chief Justice into the Senate chamber. I ask that the presiding officer do so now. The chair, pursuant to order January 15, 2020, on behalf of the majority leader and the Democratic leader, appoints Mr. Blunt of Missouri Mr. Leahy of Vermont, Mr. Graham of South Carolina, and Mrs. Feinstein of California to escort the Chief Justice of the United States into the Senate chamber. So for the further information of senators, there will be a live quorum call prior to the arrival of the Chief Justice at 2 p.m. today. I ask unanimous consent that the Senate stand in recess subject to the call of the chair. With, without objection, uh, the Senate stands in recess subject to the call of the chair. Very formal, very solemn. Uh, what you have seen is the uh, House managers, essentially the prosecutors in this case, come back to the Senate, present the case formally, reading the two articles of impeachment against President Trump. 
They now retire back to the House side. Uh, what will happen in just a few hours, about an hour and a half from now, as you heard, the Chief Justice, John Roberts, will be, uh, arrive on Capitol Hill, arrive at the Senate. He'll be sworn in as the presiding judge in the impeachment trial. Then the members of the Senate will themselves be uh, sworn in. And, and Casey Hunt, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but at that point, the trial has technically begun. That's right, Lester. Even though we're not going to see the arguments actually start to unfold until next week, uh, this will become officially the first day of President Trump's impeachment trial. And uh, as you point out, uh, this is a very uh, solemn oath that the senators are set uh, to take later on this afternoon. They will take uh, the oath together. It's do you solemnly swear that in all things appertaining to the trial of the impeachment of, Pre of Donald Do John Trump, president of the United States now pending, you will do impartial justice according to the Constitution and laws, so help you God. So that is what all these senators are going to have to swear to later on this afternoon. They're then going to be called in small groups to the front of the Senate uh, to sign one at a time that they are attesting uh, to that oath. It's an unusual uh, procedure that uh, ha unfolds here uh, in the United States Senate, as all of this is. And, you know, the, the weightiness, I think, of, the, of this occasion uh, is clearly wearing on everyone in this building as we've seen them uh, coming and going even this morning. We're actually in a, in a place in the Capitol where normally uh, we wouldn't be allowed to be broadcasting from because uh, they've created special rules. Uh, and you may in fact see uh, some senators come down these stairs behind me. But again, just to pause here uh, as we continue on this momentous day, Lester. Uh, Casey Hunt, thank you very much. And as this uh, unfolds, we still don't know exactly what the trial will look like. We do know that the pressure is building to allow witnesses and documents, uh, specifically on revelations of the last few days involving uh, Lev Parnas. He's an associate of Rudy Giuliani, allegedly involved in the pressure campaign on Ukraine to launch those politically advantageous investigations uh, that the president had wished for. I want to play a little of what uh, Lev Parnas said uh, uh, on MSNBC last night. Exactly what was going on. Uh, he was aware of all my movements. Uh, he, I wouldn't do anything without the consent of Rudy Giuliani or the president. I have no intent. I have no reason to speak to any of these officials. I mean, they they have no reason to speak to me. There is that, Hallie Jackson, and also the bit of news today from the Government uh, Accountability Office. Walk us through all that. Yeah, there's a lot, Lester. And let me start with the Lev Parnas interview that you just played. The White House now casting questions on the credibility of Parnas, pointing out that he has been indicted on campaign finance charges uh, and pushing back on his comments that the president was aware of what was happening or had a role in this, et cetera, as Parnas explains. Still, you have Democrats now, and I spoke with one Democratic senator this morning who said there should be discussions about whether they hear from Parnas uh, as a witness, potentially, in the Senate impeachment trial that, as you note, is set to begin just hours from now on the government accountability office report this is something that has just developed today the GAO, as it's called, is a nonpartisan branch, essentially, uh, independent working piece of the legislative branch that audits, basically, federal government entities. They now are saying that President Trump's administration broke the law, violated the law, by putting in place that aid freeze on money that was meant for Ukraine that Congress had passed. This, of course, Lester, is at the center of this impeachment question, whether President Trump, as Democrats allege, abused his power by withholding this aid in exchange for investigations into his political rivals. The GAO, this office, makes the point uh, when they make this determination that the president doesn't get to pick what he wants to do over what Congress has enacted into law. I was uh, speaking with a, an official from the Office of Management and Budget this morning who says they disagree with this ruling. A senior administration official says this is an example of overreach by that entity, but it is ammunition now that you are seeing Democrats already use that they say helps bolster their impeachment case here, Lester. All right, Hallie, thank you. And NBC News legal analyst Carol Lamb is a former federal prosecutor and joins us here. In that government accountability finding, they noted the president did it for policy priorities, policy reasons not using the word political. So does that take some some of the oomph out of this? It may take a little of the sting out of it, but but it doesn't affect their conclusion, which is that this was an, an illegal, unauthorized act by the by the president. And that's something the White Hands the White House is really going to have to deal with because the Government Accountability Office uh, does not 
answer to the White House, um, unlike the Office of Management and Budget, which is an executive um, agency. So, so it, it's, uh, uh, there's going to be a lot of parsing of the words in that government accountability But it does report. make the point that this was, this was a, clearly not normal. And not clearly normal not, and, and clearly not legal. not legal. All right. We have standing by former Senator uh, Kent Conrad, Democrat of North Dakota, who's been through all this before during the impeachment trial of President Clinton. Uh, Senator, I, I wonder what your thoughts were as you saw that solemn walk of, of the copies of the articles, the reading before the Senate. You know, it reminded me of how somber and sober and serious it all is. Uh, I go back to those days, uh, of course, that's 20 years ago, and I remember so well uh, the sense of the importance of it all and that it's a weighty moment. And this was a chance to be on the stage of history, and every senator is going to perform on that stage. And what they do is going to be remembered. It's going to be recorded, and it's important. This has only happened three times in our history that a president has been impeached. Let me pick up on, the, on that thought, though, this, this weight of history. Did you feel it at that moment that, that your vo vote, however this was going to go, was, was going to be remembered and, uh, and, and part of your legacy? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I think every member uh, felt that weight, that this is... This is serious, serious business. Because after all, if a president is convicted in the Senate, they are removed from office and never permitted to hold office again. And so you are overturning the results of a vote of the American people. Now, in this case, of course, uh, the president won not by getting the most votes. Hillary Clinton got the most votes. But he won in the Electoral College, which made him president of the United States. So. This is serious, serious business, and I think every member feels it. Senator Conrad, thank you so much for coming on with us. I want to turn to Andrea Mitchell in our Washington bureau. Andrea, in just about an hour and a half from now, those senators will raise their hands and they will pledge impartiality. Um, we, we have heard from both sides of this who have made very clear their positions. Um, how odd a moment might that be? A very odd moment, especially because the majority leader, Mitch McConnell, has made it very clear he is not impartial, as have many of his colleagues, the strong defenders of the president. And even since that Lev Parnas interview with Rachel Maddow last night, there have been comments by some of the so-called moderate Republicans who the Democrats were counting on to be among the four that might vote to create a 51-member majority to bring in witnesses. Uh, there have been comments from Susan Collins, for instance, saying, well, why is the House now bringing in new information? Uh, it's after the articles were published, uh, questioning the timing, whether they rushed to judgment. So a lot of questions already being raised by the president and his defenders about whether some of this new information can even be evidence. Uh, we have questions that need to be resolved as to whether it can at least be included in the opening arguments. I suspect it will be able to. But only the, uh, the documents that were finished and turned over to the House Intelligence Committee and Lev Parnas told Rachel Maddow that, in fact, that that was the rush to get it in on time, to get it into the articles before that resolution was improved. That can be included, but there are still a lot of questions as to whether video can be shown, as it was when the Monica Lewinsky depositions were shown, those witnesses. And it's really striking when we go back and look at the Tom Daschle, Trent Lott counterparts, the majority leader, Tom Daschle, a Democrat then, uh, going against, of course, his own Democratic president, Bill Clinton, in 1999, Trent Lott, the Republican. The two of them held a news conference, joking around and saying, we're going to work this out on the witnesses before the trial begins. They were working out agreements. There was a lot of partisanship, obviously, in the House side and even in the Senate. But they worked it all out, the leaders together, and came up with a unanimous agreement on how to proceed with witnesses. There were three witnesses. They were deposed. That was videoed. The video was played. So those are the issues that still... Uh, have to be resolved as we go into this trial. Yeah, Andrea. And uh, Supreme Court Justice John Roberts, as we know, will be sworn in this afternoon to preside over the trial of the president. Uh, Pete Williams has more on his role. And Pete, I'm also curious, do we have any insight into how he feels about being in this position? Well, he hasn't said anything about it. We aren't even allowed to talk to the people who advised Rehnquist. They won't talk to us when the chief justice presided over the Clinton trial. But talking to some people around him, it's pretty clear that uh, 
he, he views this, A, as his solemn duty. The Constitution requires the Chief Justice to preside over a Senate impeachment trial. But also, it's, uh, you know, it's a huge uh, uh, vacuum up of his time at the time when the Supreme Court is also working across the street. Uh, this will be an enormous imposition on the Chief Justice's time. And uh, that's something that they don't really welcome. But, you know, they're going to step up to their historical duty and the, and the uh, requirements here. So on the other hand, though, his authority is quite limited. Anything he rules on is immediately subject to a vote of the full Senate. And he well realizes that he's more like a traffic cop here or a master of ceremonies than he is like a trial judge. Yeah, that's right. You said that yesterday, and I, I shake my head each time. And it's an interesting way to look at it. This is not a typical trial. Uh, Pete not Williams. Thank you. That concludes our coverage for now. We'll be back on the air about 2 o'clock Eastern time with live coverage of Senate proceedings in the impeachment trial of President Trump. Chief Justice Roberts, the senators themselves, will be sworn in. The senators taking an oath to, quote, do impartial justice under the Constitution and laws, so help me God. Until then, for all of us at NBC News, I'm Lester Holt in New York. Good day.
This is an NBC News special report. The trial of Donald J. Trump. Here is Lester Holt. Good day again, everyone. It's just after 2 o'clock in the East. We are back on the air to bring you live coverage of the United States Senate as it takes up its constitutional duty to yeah. conduct the impeachment trial of we'll President roll. Donald Trump. Trump, there's Senator Mitch McConnell. Ms. Baldwin. Mr. Barrasso. Mr. Bennett. Mrs. Blackburn. Mr. Blumenthal. Mr. Blunt. Right now, they are just uh, deciding Mr. on Booker. if they have a quorum, which they clearly Mr. do. Bozen. The uh, trial arrived at the Capitol. Uh, the uh, articles of impeachment arrived a short time ago Mr. on Brown. the Senate side. Uh, the uh, Supreme Court Justice John Mr. Roberts Campbell. is about to be escorted into the Senate chamber. This was uh, moments ago. Uh, he'll be sworn in. He, in turn, will swear in the senators who will take an oath to, quote, <laughs> do impartial justice under the Constitution and laws to help me God, different than the one they took upon the, uh, their uh, election. Uh, so right now they're looking at a quorum. We understand there will be 99 senators in the room. Senator uh, Inhofe uh, is apparently indisposed with a uh, family medical issue. Let's go to Casey Hunt right now on Capitol Hill. Casey, walk us through what we're about to see. Lester, this is actually a pretty unusual scenario even now. Uh, it, it may seem as though our viewers are, have just uh, flipped on the usual feet of the Senate floor, but it's very rare that all 100 of them would assemble on the floor at the same time and have to say that they are present and accounted for. So what you're hearing is the, uh, the, the call of each name, uh, which is a, something that you know, we get used to hearing around here, uh, but obviously Feinstein. a very special and somber occasion here. Uh, Senator Feinstein's name was just called. She's been one of the longest serving members of the Senate Gardner. and will be one of the four chosen to escort John Roberts, the Gillibrand. Chief Justice, onto the floor of the Senate here in just a few moments. And of course, Roberts, the presiding officer uh, over the Senate, an, an extraordinarily uh, rare occurrence, uh, of course, uh, just for these impeachment trials, of which there have only been three in American history. So he will swear in the senators, uh, all in this case, as you pointed out, 99 of them. Uh, they say that Senator Inhofe will be sworn in on Tuesday with no additional delay to the trial. But the senators who are here are going to stand together and take this oath, uh, and then they'll be called in small groups to the front of the Senate to sign their names. Uh, on a book, uh, essentially underscoring uh, their commitment to this oath to do impartial justice. And that, of course, that question of what impartial justice means is at the heart uh, of what will unfold the next uh, few weeks here in the United States Senate. And Republicans and Democrats uh, seem to have very different conceptions of what that may mean as we sit here uh, trying to figure out how this is going to unfold. Democrats have been repeating their calls uh, for witnesses and documents. They say that more information is needed uh, on the floor of the Senate as part of this inquiry than what is currently available uh, from the House. Republicans say and are using that as evidence that the House rushed their impeachment inquiry uh, and that they should have simply allowed more time uh, for these uh, things to have happened. So all of that, of course, in the weeks to come, Lester, as we watch uh, these uh, ceremonial uh, circumstances play out on the floor. All right, Casey, thank you. Moderator of Meet the Press, Chuck Todd, joins me here in New York. And, and Chuck, I'm going to let the, our viewers mm -hmm. into something. We were sitting here talking a moment ago. Right. We don't Mr. quite Paul. remember exactly how the Clinton impeachment went. And even if we did, this how could run... How it was televised, yes. Yeah, how it was, I'm sorry, yes. how, how yeah. it was televised. But in terms of how this one will play right. out... Well, it was funny. There were days at a time where there was, we went back and looked, there were days at a time where they would go into closed session. And it's just the senators and it's a different type of closed session. There's, you know, no members of the press in there. Um, and, you know, there might be two days where we know nothing about what's going on other than deliberations and maybe some leaks and things like that. But it was interesting. Yesterday I was talking to Russ Feingold, former senator from Wisconsin, who was um, part of the, was a senator during the Clinton impeachment. And he said, this moment, that they're about to have here, taking that oath. He said, you know, and remember at that time, it was the Democrats who thought, what are you guys doing? This is silly. And he says, and, and, and he, he was a Democrat, you know, this thing is over, you guys overreached there in the House. So sort of the opposite role of what the Republicans are playing this time. And he says, you know, you sit in that chair, you take that oath, you feel it. You feel the gravity of the moment. And he says, and you sit there and you have to listen. And he goes, I found the impeachment managers very compelling. And he goes, and he remembered talking to then Senator John Edwards and going, hey, did you find them compelling? And he goes, yes, I did, too. He says, the point is, is that 
you don't quite know how senators are going to react once they have this moment. It is different. The weight of history might will, will be heavy for some of them. I'm not saying all of them. It will be heavy for some of them that we might not be expecting. They will be reminded of their votes right. uh, one way or the other. Andrea Mitchell uh, uh, joins us. And, we, uh, and Andrea, you know, we're trying to figure out what this trial will look like. When you say trial, people's minds immediately go to a, a criminal trial. This is something different, and we're, we're walking down this path, officially starting it, not quite knowing what it looks like. Exactly. And some of those impeachment managers may turn out to be political superstars. Lindsey Graham was an impeachment manager uh, as a House member and, of course, went on to the Senate. Some of them may rise. Some of them may fall over this. We don't know how strong their opening statements are going to be. What can they include in their opening statements? Can they include things that were not brought into evidence before? Things such as Lev Parnas's interview on MSNBC last night with Rachel Maddow and some of the things that he has said. <coughs> Things like the GAO report today saying that the president broke a law, a budget law, the impoundment law, when he actually uh, kept that congressionally approved bipartisan money from Ukraine for 55 days at a critical point when a hot war was going on in Ukraine. Uh, so there are a lot of things that have happened since the hearings ended uh, some four weeks ago. And that, of course, has been the speaker's claim that she was holding it back. But she was really not only holding it back to get more information and in, in, uh, in to, just to be perfectly blunt, they were clearly trying to negotiate something to get some leverage, which they have failed to get out of Mitch McConnell. We've yet to see what Mitch McConnell's actual rude rules of the road will be. He's going to pass resolutions. He's got the 51 votes probably for that right now going into it in the next couple of days, if not today, as to how this trial will proceed and whether video will be permitted. We still don't know what kind with witnesses are going to be permitted and you now right. we see them, them arriving. Yeah, this is the, the uh, Senate, Senate Escort Committee bringing in uh, Chief Justice Roberts into the chamber where he will be sworn in to preside over the impeachment of Donald Trump. Impeachment against Donald John Trump, President of the United States. Majority Leader. Mr. President, at this time, pursuant to Rule 4 of the Senate Rules on Impeachment and the United States Constitution, the presiding officer will now administer the oath to John G. Roberts, Chief Justice of the United States. Previous order, the escort committee will now conduct the Chief Justice of the United States to the dais to be administered the oath. Senators, I attend the Senate in conformity with your notice for the purpose of joining with you for the trial of the President of the United States. I am now prepared to take the oath. Will you place your left hand on the Bible and raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear that in all things appertaining to the trial of the impeachment of Donald John Trump, President of the United States, now pending, you will do impartial justice according to the Constitution and the laws, so help you God. I do. God bless you. Thank you very much. At this time, I will administer the oath to all senators in the chamber in conformance with Article 1, Section 3, Clause 6 of the Constitution and the Senate's impeachment rules. Will all senators now stand or remain standing uh, and raise their right hand? Do you solemnly swear that in all things appertaining to the trial of the impeachment of Donald John Trump, President of the United States, now pending, you will do impartial justice according to the Constitution and laws? So help you God. The clerk will call the names in groups of four, and senators will present themselves at the desk to sign the oath book.
Mr. Alexander, Ms. Baldwin, Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Bennett. The uh, senators now all 99 present signing this oath book after taking the oath and promising impartial justice. Uh, as we watch, <clears throat> excuse me, as we watch this, I'm going to bring in Pete Williams right now to talk more about the chief justice's role here. He immediately obviously took charge. He is presiding over this trial. But as we've noted, this is not a criminal trial. And so his powers are somewhat limited or certainly open to challenge. Yeah, a couple of things about this, Lester. First of all, number one, uh, this whole thing has a sort of steam era quality to it with the House having to go across the Capitol to tell the Senate what's going on. And the reason some of this seems rather musty is that the Senate is basically following the rules for the first impeachment trial, Blackburn. which have been Mr. largely Blumenthal. unchanged since Mr. 1868. Mr. So, for example, formally today at 930 in the morning, the Chief Justice was, for the first time, formally told that he had to come over to the Senate and preside over the impeachment. And then uh, you also heard him, uh, again, uh, perhaps uh, underscoring the fact that this doesn't happen very often. Chuck Grassley had, as the presiding officer, the president pro tem, had his script that he was reading. And Roberts came in, and you, you may have heard him say, I've got a, a little announcement that I want to make. And we were told that he might say this, that he's there in response to the notice of the trial and is ready to take the oath. So sort of ad-libbing his way into this. But here's the way to think of this. Uh, it is a trial, and in a normal trial, the judge would make the legal rulings, the jury would make the findings of fact. Now, Roberts can, and the, the rules empower him to make decisions about who can be uh, forced to appear, subpoenas that can be issued. He can rule on admissibility of evidence, whether questions are out of order, uh, materiality, all the things that a trial judge would rule on. But here's the thing. The Senate can immediately overturn any ruling he makes by simple majority vote. There's no debate. Any senator objects, there's an immediately a vote. You know, Roberts in his confirmation hearing famously said that the job of a Supreme Court justice is like a baseball umpire to call the balls and strikes. But this is like an umpire whose calls could be overturned by any members of the baseball team. So it is a very different uh, thing for that. And we also know that Roberts has studied the Senate rules, so he knows how the rules work. And he's also studied past impeachment, Senate impeachment trials, so he understands this limitation. Um, his role is quite limited. He's going to want to uh, try to preserve the decorum of the proceeding, but he's going to be more master of ceremonies than trial judge. Let me bring in uh, Michael Beschloss, our presidential historian. Michael, this whole process the last month or several months we've watched through has been defined by such a bitter rancor. And what we've watched the last couple of days, there's a solemnity to all this, a respect, a, an appreciation for how serious it is. As they take that pledge today, as they sign this book. Historically, have we seen senators approach it in a way that perhaps they didn't expect? Well, I think that's the purpose of ceremony, to remind uh, senators and all Americans that there's something larger. And that's something of the quality of this day. You know, it's been very somber and unusual, and that has been very intentional. Scene after scene that we don't normally see, those House managers coming over from the House side delivering the articles of impeachment, using words like uh, upon pain of imprisonment, which was language that we heard this morning. The Chief Justice, Justice Pete, has said, coming into this situation where he doesn't have the uh, almost total power that he has on the Supreme Court, he's going to have to exercise his influence almost in the margins with grace and sensitivity. So all this is intended to remind us that this is something that we don't normally see. And I think to remind every American that impeachment is not just a vote of no confidence. It's something that's done only in an extreme circumstance. That's why we've only seen this three times in history. We saw the uh, seven House impeachment managers, the prosecutors, if you will, uh, make an appearance earlier as they formally presented the articles. Let me go to Hallie Jackson right now at the White House. Hallie, what do we know about the president's legal team? Who will represent him in this trial? 
The, the final announcement has not been made on that, Lester, but my sources in and around the administration tell me it will be led by White House counsel Pat Cipollone, perhaps not familiar to many of our viewers, as he has not taken a high-profile role in front of the cameras in the past as it relates to defending the president, but he will certainly face that spotlight in a serious way once the opening arguments of this trial get started. He will be joined by Jay Sekulow, somebody who has taken a role on television, on the radio, defending President Trump. Uh, especially throughout the special counsel investigation. And then there will be a couple of deputies uh, and perhaps more that will be assisting Cipollone and Seculo in making some of these arguments. I can tell you that a senior administration official is telling us that they believe this should move, they think and they hope, fairly quickly. And in fact, there is a possibility that the president's defense team may not take up all the time that they are allotted in this because they feel, in their words, like this is a very weak case that is being put on by the House Kenzie. impeachment managers. This One hurts. official says that they believe it's extraordinarily unlikely that this takes longer than two weeks. If you step back, that may be an aggressive time frame, Lester, because there is still this question of witnesses. We simply do not know. Nobody right now has any idea how the witness question is going to go. And that is not something that is going to be addressed for maybe, you know, a week, 10 days or so from, from when the opening arguments start or from when the trial is, is now beginning. That's still an open question. So the speed factor is part of this for, for the president. Uh, because remember what he has coming up in a couple of weeks, his State of the Union address, where we could have the spectacle like we saw in in 1999 with then President Bill Clinton of a commander in chief delivering this keynote primetime address in front of the very chamber that by day is working to decide whether or not to remove an impeached president from office. So that is something that the White House is cognizant of as well. President Trump uh, is, is expected to be seen Mr. at some Gardner. point in the Oval Office this, this afternoon. Gillibrand. He's got an unrelated Mr. event Graham. to all of this, but it is possible he may want to react to what we are seeing right now. Frankly, Lester, even here at the White House, right down the other end of the road from Pennsylvania Avenue, you can feel the solemnity. You can feel the history here. Uh, aides here at the White House know that and understand that. I wouldn't be surprised to hear the president speak on that today, as well as some of these other topics we've been discussing, including that explosive interview with a key player in this impeachment drama, Lev Parnas, a right-hand man of Rudy Giuliani's in Ukraine, as well as that Government Accountability Office report indicating that President Trump essentially violated a budget law, broke the law, by ordering that freeze on military aid to Ukraine, Lester. All right, Hallie Jackson, uh, um, as we watch them now sign uh, the... Essentially, the oath book of recognizing uh, what they were sworn to a few moments ago. Uh, this essentially kicks off the trial. Carol Lee, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, Carol Lamb is uh, NBC News a legal analyst and a former federal prosecutor. How does the, the, the trial essentially begins right now? So when they when they get together Tuesday, what begins to happen? Well, on Tuesday, uh, the <clears throat> House managers will be starting to present their cases. They'll be uh, They'll be, you know, the, the seven of them have to get together now and decide exactly how the case is going to be presented and which Mr. of them are, are actually going Mr. to be Rono. presenting at any oh. given time. But they'll be relying a lot on, of course, the testimony and the documents that were considered during the House investigation um, process. Uh, there will be, at the same time, um, a lot of coordination about exhibits and, uh, you know, I don't know whether they're going to be playing videotapes, I imagine they will. But, but they it, don't know what they're going to be able to put, put out there. By the way, they have yes. to, I think they have to probably pass this. I mean, to do video, it'll be curious to see. I was thinking that same thing on exhibits. You'd think they would want to play some of the testimony. Absolutely, yeah. I, I think they'll probably have to pass a special law to allow video to be played. I'm not, we've not seen the Senate floor used with video before. Right, well, you know, you, you'll remember that in the, uh, in the Senate, I'm sorry, in the House Judiciary hearings, they were playing portions of the tapes. And this is what lawyers do in opening statement and closing argument. You, you play videotape testimony because that's the most impactful thing short of actually having the live. I think uh, Pete Williams wants to weigh in here, Pete. Well, they did cl play cl uh, videotape clips in, during the Clinton trial on the Senate floor instead of having live witnesses. Now, at this stage, no decision has been made about witnesses. But, you know, the Clinton trial started the same way. There was no decision about witnesses before it, uh, at this point either, after the Chief Justice and the Senators had taken the oath. However, the prospects for a bipartisan agreement were much better during the Clinton trial. They don't seem to be making any headway uh, right now. And in terms of the timing of all this, whether it's four days or three weeks, 
How does that play in the public? Well, and I think this is going to be an interesting challenge that I think the House managers have. Because of the ability at any moment in time to <clears> essentially <throat> take a ruling and, and deliberate on it, you know, this is a way to essentially slow down the trial. It may be hard to build a narrative. It may be hard to, you know, part of this is the public relations. You've got to see if you've got the public following this as well. If there are two and three day gaps in the trial as they're deliberating on a motion uh, on something because, and it may be a stall tactic for all we know. Maybe there may be a senator there that, that, that uses these motions and as ways. And people consume news much differently That's than right. They did 20 and so years if ago. you lose, you know, there's a, there's a sense where the narrative could fall off and, you know, be, you know, and how much attention to this scrap. I think that's an interesting thing to follow and to see is that part of the strategy of some of the president's supporters in the Senate to just try to muck it up, right? Slow it down, process it up. We've known during this impeachment when the facts are front and center, it's not good for the president. But in process is front and center, it's not good for Washington, right? That's when the public starts tuning out. So I do think that's going to be something to watch for. But look, obviously, we have a political calendar. This is all running in. We, we've talked about the State of the Union. You know, Bill Clinton, he was very careful not to talk about it very much publicly, the Senate trial at the time. I remember that. He had an amazing ability to compartmentalize in public. Mr. Markey. This president Mr. does not compartmentalize in public. What this State of the Union will look like in the midst of a Senate trial versus the one, but I have, we can we can forecast, we can presume, but we'll see. And then, of course, there's the presidential race. If this stays 37 days, start to finish, was the Clinton trial, from articles and all of that stuff, from beginning to end. If you use this same 37 days, this takes us through Iowa Lester, through the New Hampshire primary, right up until the eve of the Nevada caucuses. So this could have a huge impact on who the nominee is. And by the is. way, you have people in that room right now who would otherwise might be on the campaign trail. And why are we here in the first place? Because Donald Trump's obsessed with facing Joe Biden, who may be the biggest beneficiary from the timing of this trial. All right. Andrea Mitchell. Well, one thing we do know is that from Democratic sources, Chuck Schumer is planning to slow this down at the outset on Tuesday. If they don't get any kind of an agreement from Mitch McConnell, unlikely on witnesses, until after opening statements, they, the Democrats, are planning to slow it down with a series of motions on Tuesday, according to our reporting, that will mean taking a step back and not having opening arguments, perhaps even until Wednesday or later, if they continue to file motions to get a witness agreement up front before they go into the trial. And looking back in 1999, Tom Daschle and Trent Lott, the Democrat majority leader, Democratic majority leader Daschle and Trent Lott, the Republican, they didn't have an agreement, as Pete Williams was saying earlier, up front, but they worked it out. It, there was a lot of arguing back and forth, but they came together, had a joint news conference in the Senate gallery and told all of the reporters, we're going to work this out, we're going to make this happen, and they did work this it out in a matter of days. So you had a much less toxic, poisonous environment. Mr. And, Peters. of course, the President of the United States was not running for re-election. This is the first time that an impeachment is happening in the first term of a presidency when a re-election is in play, and the, as Chuck was just pointing out, we're in the middle of the election calendar. Yeah. The Republicans are still hoping to shut out witnesses. Whether or not Mitch McConnell will have those 51 votes remains to be seen. Uh, Casey Hunt on Capitol Hill right now. Casey, where are we? So just to underscore uh, that point that Andrea was just making about the differences between the Clinton trial and now, and you know we remember it as being so incredibly acrimonious, relationships here on Capitol Hill since then have just devolved to a place uh, that is so much different than where we were then. She was talking about a, a closed session, the Senate, uh, all 100 senators uh, in a room by themselves talking amongst each other to work out an agreement for how the trial would proceed. Uh, that is simply not happening at all here between Chuck Schumer, Mitch McConnell, and their associated uh, caucuses and conferences and, and, and members. You also, uh, back then, had figures in the Senate, uh, Robert Byrd, uh, chief among them, uh, who were concerned about sort of the history, the tenor, the depth of the institution uh, and what that would Mr. mean Rose. in the context of Mr. such Rose. a political process. And they, on both sides, Mr. he was a Democrat, but both Democrats and Republicans uh, worked together to try to make sure he wouldn't get upset about something. Uh, you were talking about television 
motions on the floor of the Senate, which, as Pete pointed out, were used to, to present evidence. But they had an issue because Robert Byrd insisted, he was so offended by the idea of televisions on the floor of the Senate, that they'd be covered up when not in use and they overheated and they didn't work right when they went to try to present that evidence. Obviously, so much of that has changed now, uh, but I think that overarching point that everything is so partisan, every single action is interpreted uh, as a slap in the face to the other side and vice versa, uh, it really has changed, I think, the tenor and tone of the way that this particular institution works. It's, it's a small place, only 100 people. They used to know each other very well, uh, and there used to be sort of pushes and pulls and pressures and factions that didn't necessarily only break down along party lines. Uh, and I think in this trial, that, that simply we know already isn't going to be the case. And, as for the timing, you know, I, I, I do think, uh, to Chuck's earlier point as well, uh, it seems to me right now that Republicans are pushing, uh, particularly those allied with Mitch McConnell, uh, are pushing Mr. for this Scott, to be over as quickly as possible, Mr. potentially Scott before the State Carolina. of the Union. It is not Mrs. very hard Shaheen. to lay out a case where Democrats can push it. Uh, over top of the State of the Union. We, we obviously don't know. We do know uh, that they have some tools available to them, these motions that Andrea was speaking about. Uh, but it's really not hard to see a scenario where this goes past two weeks. And then, of course, there's that big witness question. And that could push it for weeks and weeks again on end. It's really hard to sit here and say, and as Chuck pointed out, uh, this could be going deep into the political season. Still, House Democrats are going to get the chance to make the first case directly to the American people. Yeah, let's talk about the legal strategy. Uh, uh, Carol Lamb, if the Democrats were able to slow this thing down, pump the brakes, would that be with the knowledge that they've got more stuff coming in? Does it buy them time to create a stronger case? Yeah, I mean, not necessarily the knowledge, but the possibility of. And that's what makes this particular impeachment trial so, so fraught, um, I think even more so than the Clinton impeachment trial, because what you have is an allegation that the president obstructed the congressional investigation, and that is still going on. The, the, the obstruction, in other words, the Democrats believe is still going the on. Crime in progress. Right, and so as... As more days go by, you always have more possibility that another Lev Parnas interview is going to come out or, or more documents are going to be revealed. And the more people who start cooperating, it invites others to start cooperating as well, either because they're concerned about their own fate and they want to, you know, they want to get on the good side of federal investigators or because they feel less alone in coming forward. So you have this very strange situation where as this trial is going on, additional evidence may come out day by day. And every time that happens, there's going to be a motion that now we should hear this evidence as well. Look what happened during the, um, just to underscore what Carol said, look what happened during the, the initial investigation. Look what Gordon Sondland, right. who now is probably as important of a witness as there is, essentially the first-hand witness of the quid pro quo aspect of things, um, the moment seemed to squeeze him a little bit, yeah. and he suddenly, his story changed, and he suddenly felt as if he had to give more. Look at what Lev Parnas has done. A couple of visits from the Southern District of New York, and suddenly he's offering information. I mean, this is what's so dangerous to the president, is that the opportunity for good old-fashioned Perry Mason moments, which normally don't happen in trials, in this case, is possible, because you never know what Lev Parnas or other Giuliani... Uh, you know, character shows up and, and suddenly upends what we think we know about. How this. much pressure has that, the, the Le Lev Parnas, how much has that put on, on this idea of getting live witnesses in there or even on I, video? I, this is, to me, I, I, I don't know because there's a lot. Look, Lev Parnas is not a, he's got credibility issues. You know, you've got to take that, you've got to take that into account as you see what he is dumping. The fact that he appears to be cherry picking what he's dumping too, that, that shouldn't make people feel fully comfortable no matter which side of, of the perspective you are. But the, it's clear what the House Democrats have decided to do. Just put it out there. Let us look at it, meaning the press and the public. And the question will be how much is it infused in the, in the arguments that they make? Yeah. How much do they try to take? Carol, I'm curious, do you think they will use some of the harness evidence themselves or maybe just allude to it because there is some question about some senators are going to object if they try to bring that in. Well, here's the thing. If this were a normal criminal trial in normal court, uh, the documents that were put in that were obtained from Lev Parnas from his phone... Any senator who was not in the Senate chamber at the time the oath was administered to the other senators will make that fact known to the chair so that the oath may be administered 
as soon as possible. The Sergeant in Arms will make the proclamation. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All persons are commanded to keep silent on pain of imprisonment. While the House of Representatives is exhibiting to the Senate of the United States articles of impeachment against Donald John Trump, President of the United States. The Majority Leader is recognized. <clears throat> Mr. Chief Justice, for the information of the Senate on my behalf and that of the distinguished Democratic Leader, I'm about to propound several unanimous consent requests that will assist with the organization of the next steps of these proceedings. They deal largely with necessary paperwork incident to the trial. Therefore, I ask unanimous consent that the summons be issued in the usual form, provided that the President may have until 6 p.m. on Saturday, January the 18th, 2020, to file his answer with the Secretary of the Senate, which will be spread upon the journal, and the House of Representatives have until 12 noon on Monday, January 20th, 2020, to file, <clears throat> to file its replication with the Secretary of the Senate. Finally, I ask consent that the Secretary of the Senate be authorized to print as a Senate document, those documents filed by the parties together to be available to all parties. Is there objection? <clears throat> Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that if the House of Representatives wishes to file a trial brief, it be filed with the Secretary of the Senate by 5 p.m. on Saturday, January the 18th, 2020. Further, that if the President wishes to file a trial brief, it be filed with the Secretary of the Senate by 12 noon on Monday, January 20th, 2020. Further, that if the House wishes to file a rebuttal brief, it be filed with the Secretary of the Senate by 12 noon on Tuesday, January 21st, 2020. Finally, I ask consent that the Secretary of the Senate be authorized to print as a Senate document all documents filed by the parties together to be available for all parties. Is there objection? <clears throat> Without objection, so ordered. <clears throat> I ask unanimous consent that in recognition of the unique requirements raised by the impeachment trial of Donald John Trump, President of the United States, the Sergeant at Arms shall install appropriate equipment and furniture in the Senate chamber during all times that the Senate is sitting for trial with the Chief Justice of the United States presiding. The appropriate equipment, furniture, and computer equipment in accordance with the allocations and provisions I now send to the desk and ask that they be printed in the record. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the Senate sitting as a court of impeachment adjourn until Tuesday, January the 21st, 2020 at 1 p.m. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. The Senate sitting as court of impeachment is adjourned until Tuesday, January 21st at 1 p.m. And the <laughs> Chief Justice dropping the gavel there, and they'll get back at business after the King holiday Tuesday at 1 p.m. So these will be, uh, Chuck, uh, into the early evening. It is. Uh, the Clinton trial went from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m., and it was our sense that they were probably going to do the same schedule. That seems to be. They didn't say when, what each day, but the idea was let the Senate have some opportunity to do morning business. Um, 1 to 6, essentially, if they have to go behind closed doors. By the way, they will meet Saturdays. They will meet every day, Monday through Saturday. They're not meeting this Monday because it's a federal holiday, Martin Luther King holiday. But from that, non-federal holidays, they will meet six days a week, not, not, not five, um, with Sundays being the only day off. So if you're a presidential candidate, basically what they're going to be doing is probably, if you've got some money, like Bernie Sanders, hopping on a plane at about 7 o'clock, getting to Iowa, uh, and then coming back first thing in the morning. That's a grueling schedule. It's going to be rough for those guys. Uh, uh, Pete Williams, uh, we know that the chief justice has a day job. Um, he's <laughs> going to be a busy man, too. Right. So that's one of the reasons why the rules say that the Senate doesn't start on this impeachment trial until 1 in the afternoon. The Supreme Court hears oral argument and issues decisions in the morning. They'll be doing that on Tuesday morning. The chief justice will start his day there. They'll hear arguments in two cases. It'll happen again on Wednesday. 
So it gives him time to do the business of his day job and then get across the street to the Capitol for the start of the afternoon trial. All right. And Casey Hunt, we should know the Senate was busy today uh, approving the, the president's uh, yeah, trade deal with Canada and Mexico. They've got a lot of other business at hand. They do, Lester, although for the most part, uh, at least uh, the public version of that is going to be put on hold while everyone is focused uh, on impeachment. That said, as you point out, uh, they did uh, find some time to pass the USMCA trade deal. Uh, this is, of course, a top priority uh, for the Trump administration, but also uh, something that has uh, somewhat unexpectedly gotten broad support here uh, in the Congress after some changes in the House of Representatives. So, yes, uh, business does go on to a certain extent, uh, but let's underscore uh, that for a United States senator, the experience of being a juror in this trial is the opposite of everything they normally do every day. <laughs> Instead of giving speeches, uh, putting themselves out there, they're going to have to sit and listen and struggle not to fall asleep, <laughs> frankly. Uh, it's something that happened uh, not uh, un uncommonly during the Clinton years. Uh, and that's really, um, you know, not what we normally see from the senators here. Uh, I also should, should point out in terms of the timing, last time around, both the House managers and the White House gave back some of their time for arguments. The senators gave no extra time back for their part of the trial, Lester, which is, of course, their question. So you yeah. might expect them to take all 16 hours of that if that's what they have available to yeah. them. Uh, Hallie Jackson is at the White House right now. Hallie, uh, for months, the president has called this a witch hunt, a hoax. Mm -hmm. It's very real what we saw there, the chief justice banging the gavel. This trial is on. Is there any change of tone uh, from the White House? Not at the moment, Lester. And to be honest, given what we've seen from the president and the administration over the last several months, I would be surprised if that were to happen, any kind of a change in tone. You have to remember that House Speaker Nancy Pelosi knows, as we have reported since really the day these impeachment proceedings began, this is not a president who wants to be impeached. He does not like that asterisk that is next to his name now for all time. And the House Speaker has made very clear uh, she is aware of that and she is sort of digging into that with the comments that she's made over the last 24 hours, pointing out that this is a mark that cannot and, and will not be erased, no matter how this Senate trial goes. And the expectation, of course, is that right now there are simply just not the votes to remove Donald Trump from office. Nobody thinks that that is a realistic possibility at the moment. I, I will say that for the president and the White House, the challenge now, this is a president who is engaged in television coverage in a way that we have not seen from past presidents and certainly did not see the last and the only time that there was a president impeached in modern televised history, and that was Bill Clinton. Uh, I am curious to see what kind of counterprogramming, if any, the White House implements. Clinton did. That has been uh, occasional but not consistent with this administration, Lester. We might expect rallies, for, uh, further rallies, which we the will president have enjoys rallies. doing. Yes. All right. Thank yes. you. Thank you, Hallie. Let me go to a presidential historian, Michael Beschloss, for a, a, a thought about where we are today and what this potentially does to the country. Well, I think it's going to be a big test of, of us as a country. You know, sometimes people say, have we ever been as, as divided as we have uh, been during the last couple of years? And, you know, you have to go back to the time of the mid-19th century and uh, the tumultuous time around the time of the Great Depression, the division over whether we should get involved in fighting Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan in 1940s. So we've been through times like this before, but it, it happens that you have a crisis like this. It tests the ability of the country to unify. We're going to know a lot more about this country four weeks from now than we do today. All right, Michael, thank you. And so a day of solemn ceremony on Capitol Hill, setting the stage for the Senate impeachment trial of President Donald Trump, something extremely rare in our history, as has been noted. The trial likely to begin will begin Tuesday with major questions about witness testimony and access to evidence, including a good deal of new evidence still unresolved. We'll, of course, be following it all for you. I'll be back on with a full wrap-up of today's developments when I see you on NBC Nightly News. For all of us at NBC News, I'm Lester Holt in New York. Good day.